Well, ongoing political unrest in parts of the Middle East continues to have a negative effect on economies around the globe. While developed countries might not feel the pinch as much, developing markets like South Africa do tend to struggle with geopolitical tensions rising. This is Tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. And tonight, I'm joined in Cape Town by Michael Power, who's a strategist with Investec Asset Management. Now, Joburg Studios, Brooke Spector, associate editor for the Daily Maverick and former U.S. diplomat. Is it all falling apart, Brooke Spector? Here, we've got a situation where we get a passenger jet shot down over Ukraine and we've got uh, Israel and Gaza firing rockets at each other on a, an hourly if not minute by minute basis it feels like the wheels are coming off well you left out Syria and Iraq and a bunch of other places but somehow just maybe this is an artifact of the way we communicate and the way we understand and interpret the world than the actuality of, of the world itself and we're not in a we're not in a world war it depends on your baseline if we were counting ourselves compared to 1914 or 1939-40, we would say we were far better off. Compared to the Cold War days, although that was much more stable as an international power relationship, it was also rather more threatening and more dangerous. There were always the possibilities that there would be an actual hot war of major proportions that might break out between the then Soviet Union and the United States. No one is predicting that now unless some truly unexpected, unfathomable kinds of events begin to occur in very rapid progression. If you were living in a settlement in Israel just off the border of Gaza, you might think differently. If you were living in northern Syria, you might well have a very different view of things. But for the, if you take the globe as a whole, it's probably more dangerous in spots but more stable as a system. Mm. Uh, Michael Power, when we look at it, I mean, here we've got something like 40 wars ongoing around the world uh, at any one time at the moment. Uh, does it feel more or less stable? Investment markets certainly don't seem to be reacting at all negatively to this perception of higher levels of conflict. I don't want to be flippant, but we could probably have 400 wars going on at the moment, but with the amount of anesthetic which the central banks have pumped into the markets in recent years, we probably wouldn't see any reaction on the VIX. Last week when the plane got shot down, there was a blip in the VIX and it went back to almost negligible levels immediately afterwards. So it seems to me that financial markets at the moment just are not feeling pain. Uh, Michael, when we look at it, I mean, the VIX index, of course, measures volatility. And I saw a comment the other day by Tim Harford, the undercover economist who works at the Financial Times in London, saying there isn't enough volatility. It hasn't, things haven't been this dull for a long period of time. It's causing me to panic. That lack of volatility um, is a sign of worse things to come, in his view, anyway. In Africa, we always say when the bush is too quiet, be on your guard. I think there's something in that. I am... Uh, a little um, uneasy at the moment about valuations. I think the margin of safety in many asset classes uh, is almost non-existent. So when you do have uh, precarious situations like we have at the moment, uh, I don't think there's a robust environment within the asset classes that we tend to focus on on a daily basis that can withstand big shocks. So. Uh, if a big shock does come along, uh, I have to say I really am worried. Well, what is a big shock? What would count as a big shock? A passenger airliner shut down in international airspace, um, two countries firing rockets at each other across borders, civil war in a Middle Eastern country. Uh, what, what's a real shock nowadays in an anaesthetized world, Michael? I think something that would affect the oil markets quite uh, comprehensively. Uh, the closing of the Straits for Hormuz, a collapse of the uh, Iranian negotiations at the moment, I think that probably would upset uh, markets quite quite uh, significantly. We, we go back in history. I mean, the 1970s, the oil crisis brought about by similar tensions, geopolitical tensions, focused in different parts of the world. The United States is far less energy reliant on the Middle East now than it was back then. Does that contribute to the stability, Brooks? Well, clearly, I mean, the U.S. is moving toward a, uh, a position of virtual energy independence, and depending on who you read and how they make the statistics, it's about to happen or it'll happen within 10 years or thereabouts. And that's a function of what oil shale, uh, increased energy efficiency, and even alternative ener energy sources making some contribution. But I, I think we, we, we need to look at the idea that the big shocks, the big issues, uh, are less likely to happen because there are so many inertial drags on the political, the international political system to prevent people rolling right up to that precipice and staring over the abyss. 
Uh, the pressure is on, on Vladimir Putin now to find a way out of a crisis that to some considerable degree he's helped create in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he didn't order the shooting down of a commercial aircraft, presumably, but he enabled the people who in their enthusiasms for whatever purposes did and he enabled them with the kind of weaponry that allowed them to do it. But that's unlikely to happen a second time because testing the water, there was a discovery in the Kremlin that this did not generate any, uh, much, if any, international goodwill. And it certainly didn't contribute to a lessening of the, uh, the Ukraine's interest in preserving its territorial integrity as best it can, nor did it lessen in any way the ability and the interest in Western Europe or the United States to incrementally add to economic and financial sanctions on Russia. But what, what, is the, what will dissuade Russia? What will dissuade Russia from supporting Ukrainian separatists if Barack Obama, every time he stands up, says, I'm really cross and I'm getting more and more cross and if you do it again, boy, will I get cross. I'm Vladimir going, Putin's laughing at him. I'm going to paint another red line in that sand. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the problem is that the economic and financial sanctions are going to begin to hurt. If you noticed over the last couple of months, uh, the Russian ruble lost value. The stock market in Soviet, uh, sorry, Soviet Union, I'm an old school kind of guy, <laughs> yes, I guess. Uh, the, the stock markets in, in Russia lost value. Uh, international investment in Russia uh, shied away from that. These are things that begin to hurt slowly. They don't, and, but the thing that probably hurt them the most in the short run uh, was the difficulty now for the oligarchs to send their money to London to buy yet another <laughs> apartment in Knightsbridge. I yes. mean, that's a, that's a real problem. Comes but, right to home. But that's where the real power sits, doesn't it, in terms of the oligarchs and their support of Vladimir Putin. He is the great enabler in Russia. Uh, without his support, they get themselves into a spot of bother. Michael Power, we've just recently had the BRICS summit, of course, which happened in Brazil. Russia is one of our uh, best friends in the world in, in, in terms of geopolitics. How does this ultimately play out in terms of this cozy arrangement between Brazil, Russia, India, China, and of course South Africa. I think that's part of a different development that's taking place, which is that the narrative which this glorious construct called the West uh, continues to spin around the world is slowly but surely starting to fray at the edges. And in the vacuum that's being created as, uh, for instance, the United States becomes less entangled uh, abroad, we are seeing other uh, countries slowly but surely filling that vacuum. And I think things like the BRICS uh, Bank is, is one dimension of that. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank uh, are very involved uh, in trying to do, in large part, at least that's the way the rest of the world sees it, the West's bidding. And I think that there is a, a, a growing frustration amongst large parts of the non-Western world with the way in which the, the deck has been stacked against them and I think there's an attempt to try and rebalance things and I think the BRICS Bank was, was one dimension of that. Uh, that is most certainly one aspect of it but the undermining of Russia's nature as a superpower as Western sanctions begin to perhaps bite into Russia, does that undermine Russia's ability to be a constructive partner within BRICS or does this all blow over and six months from now we continue as we did before? I've no doubt that Russia will suffer economically as a result of what's going on at the moment, but we must understand uh, that by and large uh, Russia uh, is, is selling, for instance, gas to Western Europe and some 40% of their gas is coming from Russia. Increasingly it's finding other outlets for its gas. It signed a very big deal with the Russians recently and although the gas isn't yet flowing, it will within the next 18 months. And Ru Russia will move in that, into that slightly privileged position of not being forced to sell its gas merely to one buyer, namely Europe. So I think that the, uh, the balance of economic power is starting to shift. I don't think Putin's done himself any favors by events of the last week. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, in the broader sweep of history, uh, and I hope that what's going on at the moment will blow over quite quickly, I think we will see that the balance of economic power is again shifting. Uh, and the West is slowly but surely um, being contained uh, in its influence in the world. And in, in large part, 
partly because the United States now seems to be uh, a reluctant intervener. Uh, what do you make of that one, Brooks Spector? The United States' is reluctant intervener, the policeman of the world. You could always rely on Uncle Sam to come and cause a war where there wasn't necessarily needed to be one, or at least try and bail you out of trouble. Pour a little gasoline on the fire and keep things going. Exactly. Um, yes and no. Uh, I mean, part of the problem is there's no alternative credible power that will do those things. And so for, you know, for the foreseeable future, when everything else fails, there'll be the call and there'll be the reluctant ankle, dra you know, anchor dragging America coming in and doing certain things nobody else can do. Uh, I mean, it is, it, it is unquestionable that the, the United States has more military power that it can bring to bear on any situation than any other reasonable local combination of powers. Uh, the economic power still resides significantly with the U.S., although, of course, the long-term trend, you know, if you start from 1945, say, if you draw mm -hmm. the curve, there was a huge blip up and then it has been slowly dying down uh, ever since, and China will, by virtue of its huge population, have a larger gross domestic product than the U.S. in, in a dec certainly within a decade, but, and still but, uh, the U.S. maintains a predominant position within the World Bank, Financial roads still lead primarily through the United States internationally. And as I say, the military and the technological power resides there. Uh, Michael, Pye, let's wrap up with you just in terms of the fact that the status quo maintains for now. But we will see this gradual shift, as you put it. Is it a shift that takes a decade, two, five decades before we see uh, the, the Chinese superpower, perhaps the BRICS superpower, balancing out the U.S. influence around the globe? Uh, it'll probably take a, a decade. I don't think it's going to happen smoothly. I think it'll happen uh, in some respects not at all and then all of a sudden and then not at all again. <laughs> so I think it'll happen in a, in, a, in a series of fits and starts. But I do think that there are large parts of, of the world that uh, are somewhat um, tired. Uh, and I've just traveled through Latin America and that would be one region with the uh, U.S.'s behavior um, it's just beginning to grate on a lot of people. I mean, were it not for what's happened in Ukraine, uh, the Germans in particular were largely as a result of the spying that's been going on in Germany, starting to cool in their love affair uh, with the United States. One recalls when Obama was in Berlin just before he became president and there were a million people in front of the Brandenburg Gate. I doubt he could pull out a million people even now after uh, what happened in Ukraine. I just think there is a sense of, of um, uh, it's, it's like a love affair that's, uh, that's no longer as hot as it used to be. Michael and, Power, and the, the strategist that, uh, with Investec Asset Management. We must cut it there. He's on the line to us from Cape Town. Brooke Spector, Associate Editor at The Daily Maverick and a former US diplomat. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Until then, thanks for watching and good night. Bye-bye.